Session zero. What exactly is a session zero? Why is it necessary? And how the heck can I convince my dungeon master to allow homebrew so I can play my 2000 year old Neko Kitsune Warlock Priestess? In today's video, I will try to answer these questions as well as some others. And I'll help you find some points and topics that you can and should talk about with your group in session zero, so that you can smooth out the start into your campaign. You surely already noticed that this is not going to be an animation video. But, but, but we're here for the animation videos and you're trying to tell us that there is not going to be one this time? What did I subscribe for? Come on! Okay, <sighs> listen. These things take time, and we're working on more animation stuff, so yeah, next time, maybe, we'll drop a new animation. Possibly. No promises though. <clears throat> but now let's start with the actual video. What is session zero? Is there a definition for the term? Wait, is there a definition? Hmm, apparently not. What is session zero? Session zero is an optional yet helpful session before the actual campaign where people debate rules, character creation, setting and much more. Most of the time session zero is used by the dungeon master to prepare the campaign together with the players. So I was wondering about this topic and the most important points, in my opinion, that should be mentioned in this session. And boy oh boy, I expected this to be a longer video, but phew. To not waste any more time, I suggest that we will get right into our list. Number 1. Rolling stats. Probably one of the most amazing and most annoying things in existence. To see the faces of your players when they are rolling stats for their characters. The reason being that one half of your players may roll characters that are basically gods, while the other half roll trash cans of doom. Go for a neutral approach on this topic. If you are the dungeon master, ask your players if they want to roll their stats. There are alternatives though, don't worry. For one, they can use the standard array, consisting of set numbers 15, 14, 13, 12, 10 and 8. They can pick these numbers and distribute them as they wish. Of course, the DM can also determine what the array looks like. Another possibility would be point by. With point by, your PC stats all start at 8. You then get 27 points that you can distribute at will. With the normal point by rule set, you can then push your stats to a whopping 15. The points that you distribute get detracted from your points account. Until 13, one point is detracted. At 14, you spend two points for each stat bonus. This rule also applies to reducing your stats. You'll get more points the lower the stat gets. And of course, you can change the rule set entirely, making your PC spend more or less points, change the stat caps, the sky's the limit. However, if you and your players decide for the well-tried rolling, as it was pretty much always the case at my table, there certainly are some methods that you can use as well. 46, drop the lowest die, 3d6, go ham, roll 60-20 and then cry because you did not roll even one double digit stat. You get the point, I guess. But what to do if your players are not pleased with their stats? Uh, Reroll. Simple as that. Sure, if their stats are relatively or slightly above average, I will say, come on, it's really not that bad. Most of the time my players are okay with that. After all, there is only so much re-rolling that you can do and there should be a limit. Of course, there is the method of letting all your players roll a set of stats and everyone takes the one set which they like the most, but in my opinion that is pretty boring. In the end, it is your decision how you handle stat rolling. Just do it in person, so no one arrives at the table with a full set of 18 or 20s, you know? Number 2. Campaign setting. Oh yeah, the campaign setting, the heart of your campaign and therefore one of the most important things to tell your players about. If there is a certain setting or theme in your campaign, what exactly is it? Is it horror, mystery or hack and slay? Is it a homebrew setting or a pre-written adventure? Ask questions about races. Which races are accepted by society? Are certain ones hated, disliked or otherwise? Or is there even a utopian approval of everyone? Is your campaign a sandbox or a railroad or a mix of both? Will there be dungeons? crawling involved? Is there time for downtime activities? Is there going to be a lot of micromanagement of resources? As you can see, there are a lot of things to tick off here. Another important one, talk to your players or your dungeon master about the roleplaying to fighting to exploration ratio. If the players want a roleplay heavy campaign or if they like exploration, fighting more is up to your discussion. Sometimes players wishes do not necessarily align with each other. For example, three of your players may want a dungeon crawl only campaign while the other three want to 
to RP all day. In this case, you could mix it up. There is nothing wrong about saying this campaign is not for me though. You should never force your players into something. When I'm DMing, I ask my players beforehand what their ideas are, even before we start session zero. This way I'm able to evaluate their responses and we can discuss this topic on a smaller scale. Another topic I want to mention here is player discomfort. This point might not be the most typical one, but if you have any sensitive players, you need to discuss this. Every human is different. Therefore, some people can listen to detailed torture scenes no problem, while others have problems with even knocking out a single goblin. Talk to your players about things which make them uncomfortable. Find out about their no-gos, or if you're a player yourself, bring those up. Not every player wants to play a campaign where explicit scenes, gore and torture are more frequent. And I'm pretty sure I'd had a problem myself with this stuff if it came up every session. As you can see, the points mentioned here are more or less for your dungeon master to prepare beforehand and to discuss then at session 0. Let's get to the next one. Number 3. Character Introductions 13 years 13 years has it been since I'd seen all my family. My beloved mother. My father. My three little siblings. They have been killed in turn one after another by an evil necromancer. Made him his living dead. I knew I had to kill him with my own hands to send them back to the earth where they could find their eternal rest. Since then I wander this world. A lone wolf. A rogue that seeks shelter in the shades and struggles through life. Hey, wait a minute, I am the rogue, and you saw my backstory. My character's parents have been killed and sacrificed by a warlock for the evil celestial Bagrudian Schorschlag. What? Guys, I am the rogue. I've been tossed into the wild as a baby and been found and raised by a pack of wolves until they cast me out and I... Stop. Just stop. If you want to avoid these and other similar situations, please, talk about your characters in session 0. You do not have to introduce them in detail, and to be honest, I want my players to keep some things secret about their characters. Race and class is more than enough most of the time. You can play out the rest in-game through role-playing, if your players are into that, and hopefully they are, as you're playing a role-playing game. Anyway, you should make sure that the characters in your upcoming party somewhat harmonize and fit together. Or even better, let them find a motivation to travel together. I mean, why should a group of lone wolves travel around with each other? Because they're stronger as a pack? Hey, that makes sense. Damn, I have to sell this point differently. Okay, classic example. Multiple wizards in one party. Wizards are generally known for their natural competition towards each other. Every one of them wants to collect as much knowledge as possible, develop strong magic and find possibilities to use the weave to their advantage. What if the party has two specially hot-headed inquisitive wizards? There will be arguments about spell scrolls, which could be transcribed into their spell books, and while such conflicts could be amazingly entertaining, they can be a drag for the players. Especially if they happen repeatedly. And trust me, they will. That's why you talk about your party lineup. My example is completely made out of thin air, but I think you get the point here. Make your party composition somewhat fit. Shenanigans are entertaining, sure. Three warlocks, five bards, but I would save these up for one-shots and not for a longer-lasting campaign. Oh, another thing. Talk about how you handle your backstories if your players provide such. As I said, I like if they are covered in-game. Most of the time I'm getting inspired reading my players' backstories and I include elements in the story I'm telling. This way my players can learn about each other's characters, you can develop smaller character arcs, etc. Also I think it's just fun seeing the reaction of your players when they realize it's their time to shine and the story revolves around them. Number 4. Proactivity, Reactivity and Spotlight Focus All these factors can have a major influence on your game, but what do these terms mean exactly? To make it short and simple, proactive players act by themselves. They have no problem with taking the initiative and do things by themselves without the dungeon master making them react to something. They are actively trying to influence the story with their actions. The other side is the opposite, more or less. There we have the reactive player. This player is naturally more passive and they let themselves guide through the story by the dungeon master. They do what the name implies, reacting to the events and encounters the DM throws at them. Normally, with a group of 4-5 to five players you will find both proactive and reactive players, and that is okay. Not everyone likes taking spotlight focus, pressing forward and being the face of the party, taking center stage, or 
bearing the consequences or push them on other players if things go south. Do yourselves a favor though, talk to your players about it. Make yourself familiar with the roles of each of your players. Ask them if they have problems taking the spotlight. One important thing here, none of the above mentioned roles are optimal. Proactive players can shivvy reactive ones into the background. Reactive players on the other hand are able to slow down the proceedings heavily, possibly breaking the flow of your game. What's important is how you handle it, no matter if you're a player or the dungeon master. Okay, let us move on. Number 5. House and optional rules. Do you want to play with any house rules? And if so, how do they look like? Do you all have to drink a schnapps when a natural one is rolled? Will you throw your cat out of the window as soon as the barbarian rages? Please don't throw your cat out of the window. Do you light up some firecrackers if a gnome accidentally gets clobbered over the head by a rock? Get creative and agree on some house rules. At our table we adopted some trifles that we liked. For example, the interact with an object action would cost an action, but in special cases like drinking a potion you would just use a bonus action instead. Also, we're using some alternative rules like critical hitting would just double the die rolls instead of rolling the weapon die twice as normally. Optional rules are especially interesting and can really make your game a whole lot more complex. Do you want to use flanking? Does resurrection work like normal or do you want to involve any cool resurrection tables? Do you use passive abilities like perception, insight or investigation. To be honest, we've used passive perception and insight before, but how the heck do you use passive investigation anyways? I guess it's for noticing any mechanics and traps or finding clues without a role? Hey guys, let's make it simple. Leave a comment what you use those checks for and maybe we'll drop another video in the future where we will get back to it. Back to the optional rules. Inspiration. I still have not found a cool inspiration mechanic that is not underwhelming or completely busted. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, inspiration is basically used to reward players for roleplaying really well. If your dungeon master gives you an inspiration point, you can use it to get advantage on one roll only. Inspiration points don't stack, so you cannot stockpile them for a critical situation. Implementing the inspiration mechanic surely needs some prep work, if you're not a friend of just giving advantage at least. But all this really is only scratching the surface of all the possible routes you could include in your game. Not only do the source books cover a lot of those, there are dozens above dozens of creative heads out there who write, adjust and balance rules. And these are only a few Google searches away. Number 6. PvP PvP! Kill your friends, yeah! Okay... well... What the heck is PvP? PvP or player versus player is something that is not necessarily needed or even possible at every table. I think, without having any statistical evidence for this claim, you will not find people doing PvP at most tables. I myself have struggled with this topic, but in the end I allowed PvP at my table. Uh, but listen to me, before you lose it there are some constraints to that. The concept of PvP should be known by most people. Just like fighting against non-player characters or monsters, in theory a PC could attack another PC. Motivation of players for attacking another player can be very different, but most of the time it's discontent. So I said that PvP is generally allowed at my table, the only condition being that it makes sense. For example, the party rogue may not attack the barbarian just because he got one more silver coin out of the loot or slightly touched the magical dagger which was hidden in a treasure chest. It should, as I said, make sense in character and only happen if it cannot be solved through roleplaying otherwise, which is rarely the case as one or the other player character brings reason to bear most of the time and tries to smooth out the conflict. In the worst case scenario, where all that does not work out, it can happen that the PCs go berserk and then higher level spells get cast and all hell breaks loose. A long time ago we had a scenario where the newest member of the party, a warlock called Mavari with a very corrupt patron, you may have seen her in our first video, casted Feeblemind on the NPC fighter and changed him into a vegetable. The paladin disliked this pretty much, considering the fighter being his best friend and such. And I would have allowed PvP in this situation, no biggie. But it was solved through very satisfying roleplay instead and there has been something new introduced to the group. Something that I have not seen before. Distrust. Just like rolling your die, conflicts belong to pen and paper role-playing games. And PvP can definitely spice up your sessions. Talk about this topic with your players if you seriously want to allow it at your table. But keep in mind, a lot of people cling to their characters a lot, so don't get sad if someone does not want to die through the hand of another player. An alternative solution could be a battle royale of sorts during downtime. Every character brawls one another in an arena, where magical effects can happen to 
influence the happenings. This can be a refreshing change to good old adventuring. Also, this kind of PvP does not need to have any effect on the actual campaign, but can be a spin-off of sorts. Number 7. Communication Okay, listen up kiddos, this one is super important. Maybe the most important thing on this list. Communication is crucial in every circumstance. Either in your relationship, at work, or yes, in your Dungeons and Dragons group. Make this clear in session zero. Whatever happens, everyone should be able to discuss their problems. Each of your players has their private life. Everyone has a certain schedule and we cannot see through people. So please, make sure if there is a problem that comes up, talk to your group about it or at least let them know that you are having a problem. It can be harmful for your group if only half of your players are informed about something while the other half has no clue what is happening. One thing that immediately comes to mind in relation to communication are suggestions and critique. And this is important. Do this after every session. Right after session is the perfect moment to discuss things, as everything that just happened is still on your mind and you have not forgotten half of the things you would like to discuss. You can just avoid carrying around that bit of advice for your DM that would make a significant improvement to your enjoyment of the game and give it straight to him. Also, the dungeon master or even other players are able to deal with said critique and adapt to it the next session. Also, schedule. If no one has time ever, playing the game can be quite difficult. That's why you should find an appointment with your players where everyone has some time to spare. Your sessions don't have to be 10 hours long, but make sure that no one has any other urgent plans on that day so you're not feeling like you're playing against the clock. Decide if you want to play every week, bi-monthly or or even only once a month. But make sure to play regularly, so you actually feel like you're progressing and your Dungeon Master's preparations are not going to waste. Maybe you're completely insane and play every second day of the week. That has happened before, I'm sure. Snacks and breaks. Allow your players and yourself a break to breathe, process the story so far and ease down a bit. A short regeneration period for your brain can help starting anew with a bit more concentration. You should at least plan for half an hour to an hour of break time. Sure, there have been times where you play for 4 hours, have fun, forget the time and the session is over. Wow, that went quickly. And in some groups this works perfectly. But in my experience, the attention span of players goes down the drain after a certain amount of time and a break helps to counteract this. Or they get into a food coma in the break, become tired and almost fall asleep through the second half. Looking at you, Dennis. By the way, you should talk about how you handle your food situation. Do you want to use the break to cook something up together or does everyone bring some snacks to share? Do yourselves a favor though, provide something. Get yourself some comfort food, it helps. And that's it, really. Damn, I talked a lot here, welp. <laughs> but that's it, show's over folks. Once again though, let me give you a quick rundown of the 7 points we just talked about. We had stats, the campaign setting, character introductions, proactivity, reactivity and spotlight focus, house and optional rules, PvP and communication. So, to stop stalling in this video anymore, I would love to see myself off here. Thank you very much for your attention if you made it through here. If you liked this video, please leave a like or a sub. If you got curious, you can watch some of our other videos. We have more content on this channel and we're trying to get more out as soon as possible. That's it, the end. And as always, have a good one.